you know, bringing forward that kind of traditional thinking and knowledge as an intervention, a cultural intervention. Yeah. There's so much there. There's so many people here that I want to to uh, change. Well, I've been doing your nights. Yeah. Uh, So you actually she brought you in a little bit, but could you, um, kind of the same question, talk about how, what you're finding, um, where tradition is teaching ways that prove to be you know wise for modern times as well with with families and kids. Sure. Right. So. um Tonight, we're going to do a presentation, myself and Joni, and um, we're going to um, present on Pu'uhonua concept. And what that is, that's uh, uh, in traditional times in Hawaii, there was always a safe place that a person could go when they were hurting, or and it could be um, physical hurt, spiritual hurt, emotional hurt, mm-hmm. any type of hurt that they had. There was always a place that they could go, and there would be expert healers there which were usually our kupuna, or the elders, um, and they would provide uh, whatever was needed so that person could be healed and could return back to their family. And so now we're using that concept um, um, where we are, uh, where we are located in Kona, um, and providing a space so people relate to our land. It's... it's, um, it's sacred lands where we're at, and um, it's legacy land, so it comes with the history and tradition passed down and given to us today through our queen. And um, and and it was and it's interesting because usually land passes through fought through the the male side, but this is land that was given to her from her mother's side. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we you know we see that as. Um, um, the female part gender of, of caring and nurturing mm-hmm. and taking care and healing. So it's very interesting how it, 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 mm-hmm. it's, it didn't go to the male side, but it went to the female side of the family. And um, so we have a pu'uhonor that we identify with, that the community identifies with, and they can come to this place and do traditional practices. So we provide a space for practitioners to um, pass on their knowledge, um, usually to family members, but it doesn't have to be. It could just be any uh, Kanaka Maori that wants to learn and that wants to, that has a connection or some something in their mokuaha or their genealogy that brings them to that place mm-hmm. and, um, and they can learn and, and take that home to, to their family. Um, but I, I think um, one of the things that Leone had mentioned was um, the roles. And so it gives, it, so it's not only just a sacred, safe piece of land that people come to, but it's really um, providing them that place to, to explore the roles that they have. So we, we, we put together gender-specific groups. Um, so there is ahakane, so that's, that's for the men, and, and then we have ahavahine groups. And um, the children normally are with the women, and they do traditional practices with women until a certain age. And then there's a rite of passage, and they, they go to the ahakane group, and then they, they um, do their ahakane things and then we all come together I mean so for us at the Children's Center it's just it's really just providing um, bringing that practice of pu'uhonua into a modern day time because we have the resources and we have you know the people and and and, and we have the land to do that in and in a place that is so busy and, and something mm-hmm. else that we had said that traditionally we weren't like that. Mm-hmm. There were these pu'uhonuas all, all over. Mm-hmm. And there were, um, there were specific ones that for military purposes, but there were also ones that families could go to. Mm-hmm. And, and what happened with you know, colonization and losing our lands and stuff, that practice kind of faded away and now it's it's it is coming back and recognizing that really a pu'uhonua is a piece of that but it's also it can be with you and your family wherever you are so um we've got a long ways to go but um 
so much I want to ask you guys about. Joni, you, you also have been working on that as well? Yes, I work with a program that um, focuses on the Hawaiians having respite and a place to um, rejuvenate themselves uh, and get back to their outside life. So we do have a place, a safe place where they come and they rest. They get to um, experience the water and um, do protocol if they choose. So it's very enriching for, for our families. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Villanegas, you are the or one of the sort of research, you know, gurus and other things, and you've worked on a lot of different education. I wasn't able to find um, in the time that I had what you have found or what you have worked on related to early childhood. But are you hearing some? Could you? I mean, I'm hearing themes here. Could you talk about the themes that you're hearing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think. Part of what I'm hearing around too is is connection to place and land. Um, we do a lot uh, around this notion of stewardship, even in the research uh, stewardship kind of context. And what I'm hearing reminds me of something I often talk about, um, learning uh, from one of our elders, Andayukak Oscar Coagli, who would would talk about the importance of understanding who we are as peoples of particular places. So in, in our context, it's the Arctic in Alaska, and understanding that what happens in one region affects uh, what happens in the South Pacific, for example. So with our melting in, um, in terms of climate change, that we have a responsibility to speak to the land in our languages, to care for it in particular ways. And that invokes what we do with our children, how we support them in understanding who they are as people of places, um, because the people in the South Pacific have rising uh, tides and water levels. Mm -hmm. So what we do in our region really affects. So we need to know who we are in that place, and we need people in the South Pacific to know who they are in their places, because biodiversity and the ways that they care for land there affects what happens to our animals and other populations. Mm -hmm. And I think that's connected too because in our cosmology and our way of understanding the world, uh, humans are not at the center of the universe. We are one of a number um, of living beings, of power beings, um, and we have relationships to other um, other animals and uh, spirit um, waterways that we talk about. And so how we understand ourselves as um, consumers uh, versus stewards, I think it really plays into a lot of what we're learning in the policy realm um, around this notion of scarcity, that in uh, a Western frame, often uh, humans as the center really are about um, a power for our own benefit. Um, but in a lot of Native context, those who were the most wealthy were not the most who were not the ones who kept for themselves, but they were the ones who gave the most away to the um, most vulnerable and the most needy, which often uh, are our children needing to care for them in particular ways. So I think what we're trying to figure out um, from NCAI and in our research world, how do we develop um, work and uh, initiatives around health, education, that live up to that? And a lot of that is looking at roles, which I'm hearing here. Um, how do we think about uh, the roles that we have in Northwest Alaska that we can leverage and share down to Southwest Alaska. Mm -hmm. So we're developing a lot of what you might call uh, native to native comparisons. And in talking with the chairwoman this morning, Chairwoman uh, Diver, I was really struck um, by hearing about your constitutional process and the fact that you have these five other bands that you're in relationship with. How do you leverage what's happening and really working well here and share that with some of these other groups that you have kind of a political relationship and I would guess cultural linguistic perhaps some differences but how do we leverage some of that and work from strength like Michelle was talking about rather than always trying to figure out how to fill the gap we hear about the achievement gap I think in a lot of educational contexts how are our kids not keeping pace with their white or East Asian peers instead of that how do we leverage our strengths and kind of figure out um, from the Maori you know and Hawaiian language revival how do we build that? Um, how do we share some of what we've been doing in Alaska uh, when it comes to you know stewardship and environmental work? 
how do we work from those strengths intergenerationally and across boundary, which is what I'm hoping this summit, um, I think it's that's the mission and the vision for it, how do we work uh, collectively. So, you know, education is where I definitely cut my teeth, but in this position working with nations building, it's been really powerful to see how whatever thread you pull, whatever realm you're in, whether it be health, whether it be education, whether it be economics, whether it be, you know, juvenile justice, um, working around justice systems, there's connection across because uh, our people don't just live in one institution, you know, uh-huh. they cross some of those paths. So. I don't know if I took it in a complete <laughs> convoluted circle there, but <laughs> I see the threads for sure and, and the connections. There's something about, um, and I'm, by the way, I'm, I'm non-native. I'm blessed to be doing this work and I have been blessed to have, uh, you know, connections for generations with this community here. But um, are, is there a... Um, is there a connection to indigenous practice and better health, better educational disparity outcomes, better, you know, whatever it is outcomes? And I should also say um, that, you know, some a lot of these dominant culture ideas, like the nuclear family, that didn't come from Sweden. I mean, I don't know where it came from. Honestly, I think that would be a whole other great discussion to have sometime. You know, where, where did that come from? Because when I look at, and I look at how my, um, how my non-native relatives, how we interact with each other, everyone's always going to grandma's house or auntie's house or, you know, just like it is around here. So I wonder, you know, where that came from. But I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about some, maybe some findings or some other things that you've seen about, again, um, and I don't want to. Fo- I, don't, I, I don't. I prefer not to focus on the negatives, but on what is working well. Absolutely. Yeah, I think you know the the frame of a lot of the work that we've come across. And I know you folks have done many of the much of this work. Is is culture matters. Culture matters in real powerful ways. I think one of the strongest areas we have that evidence is in the language revitalization um, realm. Uh, looking at a lot of the work that I've looked at is in the Southwest. Um, a lot of it summarized on um, John Reiner's page. Uh, uh, Northern Arizona University. He's got a great website. But people like Terry McCarty has, have done a lot of work with Rock Point, um, Rough Rock down in Navajo country, and I know a lot of that has been in connection with the work um, at uh, some of the immersion programs coming in there, Punanaleo, um, Kohangareo in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, showing that students, young people who have a firm grounding in their culture and language um, tend to have a lot better health outcomes, tend to have a stronger sense of identity, um, a real commitment back to their community. That evidence is, is very well documented. So how do we take that into into an education policy realm um, when we're in an era of, of, of diversity in our schools? How do we um, talk with our schools and the federal federal government and our communities about the need for support for programs that, that generate? Um, when it comes to health, um, certainly I think the work of, of Dr. Walters is uh, some of the best that's out there and, and the work that you folks also have led um, here definitely documents that. So you got, I think you folks can talk about that um, more in depth, but I know that we're really, um, a lot of the work we're seeing come out of places like the National Institutes for Health is focusing on what's called uh, translation and uh, dissemination science, because a lot of what they found is that um, it takes right an average of 17 years to go from scientific discovery to bedside. They call it from bench to bedside in, in terms of a, a, of a drug or an intervention. Um, but now we're saying, well, but how long does it take to go uh, from clinical practice to community level? Because that's the biggest challenge. I think with um, disparities is looking at how do you not only you change systems um, but also changing um, behavior at some level. How do you get people to know what the science is, to know um, what we're learning from practice and from from clinical work and from community uh, change and to actually take that up. So there's a lot of investments in um, engaging with native researchers, with native people driving the research because we are on, you know, our people, our tribal leaders, our community members are on the forefronts of dealing with environmental change and dealing with demographic change that affects health. 
So we are wanting to promote that piece, and that's where our work as NCI with research comes in, that research, we assert tribes have sovereignty over research that happens on their lands and with their citizens. Um, and we, we believe that that's what's really going to bring the change when it comes to health disparities, because we've seen it in certain places. We've seen how um, the special diabetes program for Indians, for example, which was an intervention, traditionally the DPP, the Diabetes Prevention Program, was one-on-one, -on -one, trying to work with people one-on-one -on -one about exercise and health. Well, with the special diabetes program for Indians, they made it a community intervention, right? So families coming together to talk about food preparation, to talk about women's you know, exercise groups, to get together at that community level, saw the same, if not better, um, uh, benefits because it was about working with community processes of relationship and development. So that's one of, I think, the shining examples um, that we're trying to take to model into other communities and to share what's working well in certain regions and say, what can be translated across in different ways? And what's particular that just won't work with some of these interventions. But I know other colleagues have done a lot of this I was going to ask too, if you, know? you wouldn't mind picking up where she left off. Derek. Yeah. Um, you know, I, 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 I don't work with, uh, um, typically I haven't worked with uh, in the, the, the zero to, to eight, zero to three. Um, um, but some of the work I've done with was like with fourth and fifth graders, uh, with younger people, uh, you know, the 10, 11, and 12 year olds, um, trying to get their their take on health and health issues uh, and where they are. So I've worked with communities where there's there's been researchers in uh, for, for many years, uh, and they're getting information from the clinic and from. Um, from the school, and so all these adults, basically. Uh, and so there's never been, uh, uh, in, in this particular community I worked with, there, there was never any uh, uh, youth voice. And so I came in and, and, and using some uh, alternative, what they consider alternative methodologies, um, or, or non-traditional methodologies in, in academia, and I would say they're, they're more congruent with traditional uh, uh, Indian methodologies uh, of, uh, uh, of research and dissemination of information, uh, storytelling, and, uh, and being able to uh, um, use imagery to tell those stories. Uh, so I, I gave kids cameras. They uh, uh, they photographed for two weeks what was healthy and not healthy in their communities. Um, they also had G GPS units so we could see how they moved around in the communities, mm -hmm. uh, how far away food sources were, where they were getting their uh, bulk of their food from. Uh, so there's information that comes out of that that... Um, that the, the community could use the the, the um, elders board, which oversaw the curriculum at the school, was a tribal school, um, realized that there's some uh, deficits that they hadn't uh, accounted for, um, uh, pertaining to language and to traditional foods and things like that. Because the kids the kids didn't know what a, a, a um, a healthy meal looked like. They knew what an unhealthy meal looked like. They, they knew the, the Flamin Hot Cheetos were, were bad, uh, and they had you know, 200 pictures of Flamin Hot Cheetos out of 2,000, you know. So um, so with, the, with trying to use different methodologies that are more accessible to the communities uh, and, and mean, more meaningful to the communities, um, figuring out ways to, uh, Leon has talked about this some, about disseminating um, uh, information that's more accessible, not just to the academy or to uh, academia, uh, for a select few people just to profit and uh, make careers on. Uh, really trying to figure out how to make uh, sustainable change uh, in communities and, and these paradigm shifts. Uh, having native communities be more pro uh, more proactive, I think that's what Rich is trying to do. Uh, getting tribes to be more proactive about research and uh, tapping indigenous uh, researchers. Um, and uh, we we we've had that uh, uh, historically have had um, you know all those problems dealt with within the tribe we've had uh, uh, super intelligent folks uh, uh, who you know, sit in a room like this and, and have discussions and, and solve problems and issues uh, um, and that's something we need to I think get back to uh, get back to uh, relying on um, ourselves to solve our problems uh, and not be in relation to uh, our, our uh, colonized experience. Uh, I, I kind of I, there's one metaphor I, I always talk about, and sometimes this ruffles feathers, but I, I really have a problem with the walking in two worlds metaphor. Uh, that I have my white man's shoes and my uh, my Indian shoes. Uh, uh, that to me is a total non-native 
construction. Uh, and uh, I, I choose to be who I am, uh, and, there, and there's nothing wrong with me being a, a Sack and Fox person. Uh, so if I, if I like to, uh, uh, if I like uh, good food, that doesn't make me less than a Sack and Fox. Uh, you know? um, so being more proactive, saying this is who I am, and I can still be this way, uh, and, um, and, and I'm not going to let anybody else define uh, who I am, and so walking in that walking in that two worlds is. I feel like no, I'm, I have uh, my Indian shoes on all the time. Uh, I have my Indian feet, my shoes at least. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, and so I, that's kind of how I approach my research. Uh, I, I I think that's uh, I think it's a construction that uh, it kind of really kind of paints the picture to, to uh, all the problems. Uh, you know, we we're still trying to say, oh, this is a this is a white man's world. We're going to try to operate uh, in over here in the white man's world. Then we got to go back into the reservation world, which is actually a, a white man's construction. Um, and so being uh, more proactive in defining who we are and taking more control of who we are. And, and that starts with, uh, um, you know, uh, with conception, really, uh, uh, and how uh, tradition, uh, each tribe uh, traditionally or historically has uh, um, treated their children and uh, uh, being um, more... Um, more involved, uh, you know, everything, everything from you know from breastfeeding, you know, we still uh, uh, in com commodities uh, and how we identify as being Indian, you know, whether it's uh, we're saying oh fried bread or Kool Aid, spam, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, and saying oh those that's that's we can reject those, we can reject those and say no, we we can define uh, what is healthy to us and not in relation to necessarily the mainstream, what our family should look like. Uh, um, and not in relation to mainstream. So, no, that's, and it, it ties along with, with sovereignty too. This idea of uh, sovereignty is this um, is breaking away because of, of, of being forced included, mm -hmm. uh, and so we're trying to, to pull back. Saying, no, no, we want to we want to be included, but on our own terms, uh, and, and be more active <coughs> doing that. So, I think that's kind of how I approach uh, research and hope to see how um, uh, tribes and. Uh, um, and researchers uh, deal with Native communities and, and how uh, uh, people raise their children and, and, um, and hope that there's more generations to come that can keep solving these problems. So we're kind of laying the foundation for, mm -hmm. uh, for uh, more growth uh, and, and being able to see those connections uh, and not be limited by uh, metaphors that are, aren't necessarily Native. So. I have... I'm going to try and limit myself to one or two more questions for, for, for you all. Um, and, um, but first I wanted to ask two questions. Um, and I'll ask them in reverse order, I guess. Uh, I would like to know if any of you all have, uh, first of all, I'd like to know if you would like to, if you'd like to take a break for a moment, if someone would feel more comfortable if they took a break. Um, if anyone, and I can just open this up, and actually I had a quest, specific question for you about this, but I want to open it up first. What do you have, what kind of response do you have to what Derek was just talking about with the, um, um, this thing that I wrote down, the walking in two worlds, and then I drew a circle with a line through it. I mean, I saw people nodding, I heard some, you know, um, you know people responding. Can you know, just throw it open a little bit if you wanted to respond to that somewhat? Yeah, Michelle and I are married, so that might be a good question. <laughs> well, I was, I was going to go right... <laughs> <laughs> Can you ask someone else? <laughs> I'll, 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 give, I'll, give you, I'll give you all Michelle's, Michelle's question, a question that I had for Michelle, and that is that um, a couple weeks ago, or maybe a week ago, I actually talked to talked to one of your students, um, uh, uh, Muscadie Montano, who's um, from from Red Cliff Nation, and has had a, uh, you know, we did an interview, so I can share the things that she, some of the things that she shared in the interview, but she talked about working um, at a store where she didn't feel like she was really being respected in the store. And she had had, you know, some her life journey before that, um, but she was a young adult, and she was like, "I'm going to school, and I need some help with my schedule." And mm -hmm. and the school and the workers being like, "Well, you're probably not going to last in school anyway, really. So I don't know if you want to walk away from this job." And she said something like, "Well, you know what? I have to, 
do this. You know, I'm putting words in her mouth, and maybe I'll maybe I'll put that interview piece in if we do if we use that that part for broadcast. But um, what is it about? And again, it's, I think I could open this up to all of you. Talk about being indigenous, but going through a European created credentialing system and. Uh, and uh, I mean, you talked about being in the um, in this school, Riki. You know, this school is. I mean, look at it. You know what I mean? I mean, the school that the elders, the elders who live around here would tell us that the school is in the school forest, which is behind the school, mm. and yet we're in this building. So, I'm taking it too yeah. far. But could you talk about? Um, I, I guess part of the question for. Um, you, Michelle, yeah. um, is, you know, how does one go to school, do all these things, do things in a traditional way, but maybe you need to go take two weeks to go on a, to take a canoe trip down the river with your family. Right. Maybe you have, um, maybe your wife has a miscarriage, mm -hmm. you know, and then you need to do cultural practices with that. Maybe you're, um, uh, you know, you, you yeah, yeah. I mean, how, how, how does one accomplish these things if it's not I mean I don't even know how to say the walking in two worlds thing now based on what you said well I, say, I could say um, that I do agree with Derek Anyways, <laughs> um, <laughs> overall we agree there's some fine fine tuning but, um, we'll, we'll color to paint the, the new the new <laughs> room <there. laughs> but, um, but you know I think that's part of it for me going to school I'm Choctaw my family um experience a boarding school and I grew up with grandparents and um, you know my parents never attended a parent teacher conference in my life um, that I can remember they may have attended fun when I was younger um, but they were always very supportive on what I wanted to do whatever I excelled at you know I didn't excel at cooking there can tell you that um, I didn't excel at you know bead worker being still um, but I did excel at books books was always something I loved I would be lost for hours reading a book from start to finish at a very young age and so my family really supported that and that you know Michelle's the book smart one she's the one who's going to do whatever and help us out you know become a lawyer become a doctor or something along those lines um, and I always knew that no matter what happened I could always go home and they would take care of me and feed me and be there for me uh, I didn't have any financial support to go to school at all but you know, at the same time, you know, I knew I had that emotional support. So for me, going to school wasn't about just myself and going through, but it was to go through this system in order to give back in some way. And because that was my personal strength compared to my other um, family members who are all extremely intelligent people just that chose a different path and what they wanted to do in life. And um, so I felt obligated that I had to go through and, and be removed for a time being um, and part of it is to just not walking in two worlds. I never thought, oh, I have to, you know, not be Indian today and, you know, just go through the schooling system. But, you know, in graduate school, um, I would just show up with my baby in the classroom. I had a friend who asked me, how did you ask permission? I'm like, oh, no, 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 I don't ask permission. <laughs> like, my belief is that you don't leave the baby alone for the first, um, you know, year or so of life. So I had the baby in a sling, and I just showed up with the baby. And I was in a great program that um, I never received any negative feedback. In fact, the professors were very supportive during my doctoral work and, and would even hold the baby while they were lecturing at times. So, um, and, and uh, you know, the flip side is because I always had the children with me, they knew how, to, I think, to interact and behave, the, the girls especially when we were younger and always in those classes. Um, and there was always that end goal of it's hard, especially uh, writing a dissertation was extremely hard. That was more psychological and that I am a first-generation college student. I don't you know, have any other relatives who've gone through the process mm -hmm. before. Um, you know, my parents... Extremely intelligent people didn't graduate from high school, um, so it was it was very different. And to get over that hurdle, of, I'm this um, native woman, indigenous woman, trying to complete this degree, and I'm like, part of it felt false. Mm -hmm. So I think once I got over that and realized, and met some wonderful mentors, mm -hmm. Dr. Walters is one in particular too. That's like, yeah, you, know, you need to do this and finish it up, and and was actually um, on my side and and helping me when um, 
I needed to finally get the final approval, which went through well. I, it just took a little longer than I anticipated. Um, but having a, a group of support and mentors, especially Indigenous mentors, was really pivotal in, in any of my studies. Um, and also having a partner who is also Indigenous and, and going through the same things at the same time was really helpful. We had a professor from um, New Zealand come. I guess I'll open this up to you, to at least to you two. Um, uh, he came and he actually talked about language preservation in New Zealand, how important it was. Dr. Timothy Kareto, I don't know if you know Dr. Timothy or not. Um, one of the things that um, he talked about was that there wasn't a forced um, boarding. He didn't describe it as a forced boarding school system in. New Zealand, but you, some of you have talked about it here. So how our um, the education system in America is um, that you know people were forced into boarding schools and it, it transformed families. You know, and it was, and it was you know, they're, they're been called genocide in Canada. Um, I don't know why it hasn't been called that here necessarily, or there hasn't been an apology in the United States, mm-hmm. but. Um, but could you talk about, you know, like your own process of credentialing and, you know, licensure and all that stuff when you have your deep knowledge, which may, which may not even be recognized at all in, this, in the system that you're going through, and then you also need to, you know, follow those kind of procedures like Dr. Johnson Jennings was talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I think in terms of... When we, when we think about um, native schooling in our mm-hmm. country, um, there is not the same removal uh, and forcing of entire families into residential schooling. But the early schooling we had was, it was uh, a boarding school system. And um, so in many ways, how we've described native schooling in our country is that it was like a Trojan horse. Mm-hmm within communities. Mm. So boarding schools were built inside communities in order to change mm-hmm. entire traditional thinking and ways of being. So the essence of schooling itself uh, is the same. It's still a, an idea of assimilating, of mm. removal, of uh, taking away of language, mm. of individualising children in order to have a notion for them to grow into a uh, an idea of individualised everything as opposed to collective well-being, mm. uh, the removal of lands. Um, there's a whole range of elements that came to our country from what they'd already experimented on uh, here and in other countries. Uh, so the schooling system really has not worked at all for our um, people. Um, it's been nearly 200 years. The first school was opened in 1816 in, in uh, the East Territory. Mm-hmm. It's going to come up to a 200 year anniversary soon, and it continues to not work particularly well for Indigenous students. So, And equally, the higher, you know, the tertiary, the university system has continued not to work uh, well for our people. So, in terms of Timothy's you know, conversation around the language he would have talked about in the early 80s how the way that we um, dealt with the continual failure of our children because the system failed them and the continued removal of our language and the near death of our language was that we walked out of the system Mm. and established our and that's been an ongoing um, development since 1982 when we had the first language nest developed. So I think those issues are still inherent to our experience of education. Mm-hmm. Education is very Western uh, at home. Still, you know, 85% of our children are still in a Western education system. It's only about 15% in the measure. So I think we have the, an appearance of there being more, <clears throat> but actually in reality within the system, mm-hmm. we're very small in numbers. Um, and just picking up on the two world idea, the walking in <clears throat> the walking in two worlds is so within our mission schooling we have our own philosophy of education and one of them says that we will provide education that will enable our children to walk in two worlds, to survive and to thrive in two worlds. But the assumption is not that that is a Māori world, an indigenous world, and a white world. That could be any world. That could be that they can thrive in a Māori world and a white world. 
for a Māori world and a Choctaw world. So we don't assume that, that those worlds are only about a colonial world. They're actually about a global world. And the, the idea is that our children and our young people will grow and flourish very fully in their own identity, as Derek was saying, wearing their own Māori feet and whatever shoes they like, as long as their feet stay Māori, uh, and that they can walk in any world mm. in a very firm identity of who they are. They know who they are, they know where they're from, and they don't have to adapt themselves mm -hmm. to be a part of those worlds. And that's really a key aim for our young people, is to walk in any world as they are as Indigenous people. Mm -hmm. I think that's around the Indigenous world generally. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and when I think about the, you know, the role of the Indigenous academic, that there are ways of being, you can be an Indigenous academic or you can be an academic who happens to be Indigenous mm. and they're not the same thing. Mm. An Indigenous academic is committed, in my view, to their community, to their people, to their lands, mm. to their knowledge, to their learning. And they take that and we take that wherever we move. And I think if you're an Indigenous academic in that context, and something like getting a PhD or becoming a assistant professor or <clears throat> becoming a professor or whatever we do in that university context is always driven by who we are as Indigenous people. It's not driven by the PhD or the doctor mm. in front of your name. But that's a useful tool in the system. And so, you know, in session meetings, I'll walk in the room and the first thing I do is I throw my white credentials on the table. You know, I'm an associate professor, I'm a doctor, I'm a this and that. And the room changes, with, particularly with non-Indigenous people in the room. Yeah. And then I'll go home to a, to a tribal gathering and I'll go in the back and I'll wash the dishes like everyone else. Because being a doctor does not change the fact that dishes <laughs> have to be washed. Yeah? So that, and I think that's how we carry ourselves, yeah. I think, uh, in the world. I think that academics who just happen to be indigenous mm -hmm. uh, can actually be quite dangerous for mm -hmm. us uh, if they just maintain the same old way of being, mm -hmm. the same old, same old. Um, but that they use their indigenity, or they use being Māori or their tribal identity as a badge to move them through uh, uh, their individual progression or career path uh, without the same accountability. So I think that. You know, it depends on where you're coming from. We don't do very well with academics who just happen to be Māori um, because they tend to not be that useful for us. Mm. Dr. Graham's term, professional, there's a term he has. Um, he does. About, uh, something about professional academics or yeah. something of that sort. But yeah, I want to follow up just very briefly on the two worlds piece as well. Um, we did some research in Alaska um, about, uh, we looked at the data coming from the schools and we took it out to the communities and said, okay, we know uh, information about dropout, graduation, school attendance, and test scores. Does this tell you about your kids and the ways that you need to know about your kids in order to plan and to do your work? And they said no. So it's, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. So we did some research to ask, what is a successful Alaska Native student? What does that look like? Um, we asked our young people, we asked our elders, we asked our, our parent generation, our community leaders. And they were, we moved from a, a model of um, school-based success. How do we make our schools more effective and successful to a model of student-centered uh, success? And it was really based on roles, bringing it back around to where we really started the conversation. Um, our community said, in order to a successful Alaska Native student is threefold. One who knows who they are and as an individual, the particular gifts and talents that they bring and can have that nurtured. The second layer is um, a successful Alaska Native student is one who knows who they are in community, in human community by and large. Their sisters, their brothers, their, um, their aunties, their uncles in this context, their daughters, their sons, grandchildren. And then the third realm was a successful Alaska Native student is one who understands uh, what it means to be a good human being. 
and that's about our relationship again, our cosmology, um, to other forms of life, spiritual, animal, plant, um, in these contexts. And so it was really about helping our kids, designing our educational interactions to help them understand their roles as individuals, as members of communities, and as human beings, kind of out that way. And I remember as part of this, because this notion of two worlds came up a lot in the in the research, I remember talking to one of our elders and saying, what do you think about this notion of two worlds? Um, and he said, you know, I think probably I've done it over time, but the world that I'm most concerned with is the world of tomorrow. And we can't know what that world of tomorrow is going to bring for our children. So all we can do is prepare them to know who they are in these different contexts, to have a range of skills and supports to draw on, regardless of what comes. And I think that's the message that I that I carry every time I hear this, and we have this conversation a lot about two worlds. I think it is multiple worlds. We wear multiple identities because we have multiple roles. And whatever context you know we're facing today is, is new and different in some ways. So I just I really appreciate the emphasis on role, and it's really helped me also think about the academy and what our role as, um, our, what is our role in relationship to research, to knowledge. Mm. It's not knowledge production, it's knowledge relationship. And what is our role and responsibility to non-native people, um, many of whom continue to train our teachers and those who are teaching our children, um, many of whom are training those who are caring for the health of our people. Um, and that's been a struggle for me to think about that I have a responsibility um, to help them understand our ways and develop cross-cultural communication. But I think that's just part of the reality. So two worlds on a multiple. Yeah, and that is, and that's me, by the way. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm one of those people that is working with families, and I'm, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge honor and a blessing, but, I mean, it's, it's not the same. You know, it's definitely not the same. I just wanted to ask you, um, Joni, you just, you were listening so intently to what um, Leone was talking about with the, with the, the two worlds and the, the combination of cultures. It just seemed like you just, I was just, just sensing that you were, you were relating so well. I wonder if you could talk about that or you were immersed in what she was saying. I wanted to ask you about that experience. I'm just um, honored to be here and listen to all of this because I'm not in a, um, a field, but I do work with Hawaiian children mm -hmm. and it is hard to um, bring two of the, the Western style and or the Western ways and the Hawaiian culture together. It's a really tough balance, but just being able to hear everything from um, all of you really lifts me up. Mm -hmm. yeah, feelings are okay here. Mm -hmm. so, um, Dr. Bill Vegas, I wanted to ask you about um, this is getting into um, gender a little bit, which I stipulate again that I'm not I'm not native and I'm also not uh, a woman. But um, I when I was kind of you know, scanning around for some things that I wanted to ask you all about to try and mine as much of your expertise as I can um, while I have you here. Um, I noted that you had presented um, on a, a pattern, pa a panel about um, women and um, gender, but some very well-known white women. Um, and earlier this week, on Twitter, which is this social media network, are you you know where I'm headed? You know where. So so give the background and then uh, assume the question is, what is the connection between um, and and I can broaden it a little bit out and say that like we have this mining um, we're broadcasting um, from um, hearings on mining, which is on or and near. Um, native land in Wisconsin, and so sometimes um, white people are appropriating native culture, and are they doing it in solidarity, or is this some other thing? So, mm -hmm. sure. So just briefly, um, the project uh, that we're a part of was uh, originally called "We Can't Just Be Friends." And um, it was uh, promulgated at a conference um, where um, women of color were on the panel. Um, this was an NCOR conference, National Conference on Race and Ethnicity. And um, there was a white woman, apparently, who stood up, I wasn't there, um, who said, you know, what's all of this about race and, and, and ethnicity in higher ed? Why can't we just be friends? 
And so out of that moment, uh, a book project came about where we decided, I was invited um, by the editor uh, because there wasn't there weren't any Native women uh, involved in the conversation at the time to talk about what it is to be in relationship in the academy uh, between uh, Native uh, women of color and white mm-hmm. women, and particularly out of the teacher ed realm, because again, this is where um, many of these uh, issues kind of come up. Uh, how do we bring up the next generation? You have cross-cultural um, issues. And it was a really powerful moment for me um, because I was actually in Australia at the time on a team. Um, uh, Australia issued a national apology to the Stolen Generations, um, and the uh, local Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people said, thank you for that. We appreciate it. It's symbolic. But... Um, put your money where your mouth is, invest in our community's government. And so the government invested in what they call the first uh, national indigenous education um, reform in Australia, and it was called uh, Stronger, Smarter Learning Communities, which was essentially investing in training principals, school principals, to do their work differently, um, to be more culturally responsive, to to see the strength in culture. And they brought in an indigenous um, team of evaluators uh, to come and or a team to to evaluate this initiative. I was part of that team as my postdoc work and it was one of the hardest experiences of my life. Um, I was led by a team of white women, uh, qualitative researchers, and there's a long lot to the story, but essentially my indigeneity was challenged by these white women. um, uh, And, you know, part of my role was to say, to put indigenous people at the front of this work um, and to challenge them to say, if you're leading an international indigenous project, you know, you need to look at your own kind of process of whiteness. So I wrote in the book about um, uh, the title of the chapter, and I co-wrote it with uh, Adrienne Ormond, um, who's a Maori a scholar. It's called On Friendship, Kinship, and Skinship, mm-hmm. um, looking at different ways of being in relationship and the fact that I said, you know, we don't need friends. We need sisters in this work and people who will take up the cause. So the Twitter um, piece that you're talking about actually has us all a Twitter with the book project because we presented it. We had over 300 people at our small conference session the first year, and we did another session last back last year as all of that but the book I, I you know I'm not trying to sell books but there's a couple of chapters one called um White Women's Tears that talks about emotion in the workplace and and how to kind of navigate. But there's a couple of others that I would really suggest. But the Twitter work is about, it's called um, Solidarity is for White Women, uh, is the hashtag that people are posting. And they're posting examples of, um, about privilege. It's a lot of uh, women of color posting about their experiences um, as women of color and how our experiences often are not centered or valued or heard or appreciated or seen in the same ways and I've been really encouraged by some of the responses from people who say that they're white women posting um, saying our job is just to listen to this and thank you for sharing this and that's kind of the experience with the book um, a lot of these women are deans who I uh, co-wrote with, uh, co-wrote chapters in the in the book, talking about what it means to be um, leaders of diversity in a campus when they are white women, and so talking about higher education. But I, I mean, I this work, the experience in Australia was really important because when I came into my current role, I was leading a cross-cultural team. We had Native and non-Native people on my team. Uh, at this point in time, we only have Native people on my my team, but I do. But we're not all from the same in place and I see the value in cross-cultural work and I'm actually um, uh, finishing reviewing a chapter that's going to come out of our research in uh, community-based participatory research it's all about researcher identity and one of the claims in the in the piece is that power sharing is that is the central is the most important component of building research partnerships and I'm going to actually challenge that because for me what I've learned in building research partnerships is cross-cultural communication is actually the most critical uh, part um, because power sharing is, is, is key, but it doesn't engage trust. It doesn't engage coming to really be in relationship. It's about 
about scarcity of resources in my experience. Power is one of those things that we need to get into, but I feel like the cross-cultural communication is really where policy needs to head, where systems development needs to head. And so again, I'm going in a circuitous route here, but it does it does link back to developing relationships, I think, across our different positionalities and learning how to see the world as much as we can from different kind of vantage points. So. Mm -hmm. Can I, can I just comment on that, um, and particularly around the allies and yeah. the, the white woman issues? Yeah. Um, we just uh, attended a conference in Denver for the pedagogy of privilege, mm -hmm. and it was uh, an, an interesting, you know, engagement for Lydia and I because we we take a very strong position around the involvement of non-indigenous. Uh, people in our work, and a key centre to that is what we'd call um, Te Tanga, which would kind of equate to sovereign control, self-determination, um, you know, and the ability to define our own research, our own work, our ways of being. So, so we have a very strong movement that is about um, you know Indigenous people taking the centre being in control, determining the pathways for our people. The reality in our country is we've had 200 years of colonisation and they ain't worked. Now, if, if, if that mainstream way of being was going to work, it should have worked already. It's been 200 years of doing it. So time to give it away now. And it's time for us to take back the place that we had originally, which was about the self-determination over our own lands and our own way of being, which is also uh, entrenched in our treaty relationship that we have. Um, so in 1840, our ancestors knew that was the place, that was where we needed to be. Um, so in this conference, and it's kind of interesting around the Twitter mm -hmm. engagement, because I haven't been on Twitter since I've been here, um, but the idea that uh, a white woman uh, listening to hear our voices is very fabulous, but never enough. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not enough. And one thing that came up in this Pedagogy of Privilege conference was a woman stood up and said and challenged an uh, African American man who was talking about racism. Um, and, you know, and she stood there in her challenge with a sense of entitlement that made us want to say to her, hey, sit down. Mm -hmm. And this was talking about Pedagogy of Privilege. Mm -hmm. And then it was followed by another woman saying, I'm here and I'm learning to feel comfortable in my uncomfortability about my privilege. And we're going, well, that's really great. It's really great to sit comfortably in your uncomfortableness. Welcome. And actually, we need you to do some work. You know? We don't need you just to listen to us. We need you to go and challenge your own power systems. We need to challenge your own privilege. That's a role. We need you to challenge your own communities. We need you to teach your own communities. We, we don't have time for people to sit there uncomfortable for a few years while we're out there doing the work, trying to make change. So it's a transformative relationship, I think. It's really important. And so we will work with people who will ally, Mm. with us who want to do the work you know who want to do the work who want to support the work but don't want to be in the control of the work or the defining of the work or determining the work um, but who are really willing to mm. work alongside us as allies and so those are the people that we'll work with across the board um, in terms of dominant groups I'm talking about uh, within our country and so you know, there is a real um, need for, you know, allies to actually be, you know, so I just feel like, I feel like saying, just get over yourself, you know, our kids are dying, our, you know, schools are killing them, hospitals are killing them, police are killing them, hey, and we've learned so well that we're killing them, we don't, we don't have time for you to sit around and be uncomfortable or just, you know, listen. Because people in positions of power can make change quite quickly. Good deans and faculties, good you know directors can actually make changes quite quickly, as long as they're allied to the kind of change that we're wanting. So you know we're having a little engagement with a professor, uh, you know, Pākehā woman, white woman in um, in New Zealand, 
who I've seen, you know, I've seen as being you know, a pretty good ally alongside the work that we've been doing. She does her critique of feminism and she's worked alongside us, really great. You know, and then last year decides that she's going to write about Kopa for Māori, which is Māori philosophies of schooling and education. And I'm going, no, no, no. You know, that's, that's crossing a boundary. That's appropriation. That's about using this knowledge that you've been working alongside to benefit your own academic self, mm. not to benefit our communities. And it's in total contradiction to what we're saying, which is actually work alongside us, but don't take our stuff. It's like what um, the tribal chair was saying tonight, uh, this morning. We're, you've already taken enough. You've taken enough. Don't keep taking now. Um, so, yeah, I can't believe I can feel my blood. <laughs> I, was, I, I actually had in my other machine, I had some research, or I, I did a little bit of research uh, about some research that I believe you did about differences between, or con comparing and contrasting, Euro you know, European ideas, or was that, was, was that uh, and, uh, and Maori ideas? Around research? Around, not, no, 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 around, um, the basic, you know, pedagogies of education, yeah, and and story even, you know, because like I I grew up and most of us think of this kind of uh, Joseph Campbell kind of idea of story, but your, but but my understanding is Maori stories and maybe some of the other stories, um, Anishinaabe stories do seem to sort of follow some of those those kind of hero's journey type things, but. Um, but if your story is defining, like you were saying, Derek, you know, or part of what defines you, you know, the stories are different. Um, could, I, could I just add absolutely, one, yeah. more, one more step further to what Leone is saying is that um, in finding allies, um, non-native allies, um, what we find in Hawaii is that when they recognize it's time for them to step out, mm -hmm because part of our kuleana or our responsibility as Native peoples is to be educated in however many worlds we need to be and then provide, go back to your community or whatever it is and, and, and give back. That's our kuleana. And, and our allies need to recognize what their kuleana is. And when, when it's time to step away, because as our nation is building, and, and we are getting more educated and we're starting to spread, then it's time for them to back off. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so so that's where we find um, where we need the allies is, you know, you got to fill a gap right now, help us, mm -hmm. um, um, follow us, mm -hmm. not take the lead, but know when it's time mm -hmm. to, to kind of, you know, mm -hmm. wither away or whatever it is, mm -hmm. you know, and, mm -hmm. and, 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 um, Give us that um, that place and and um, let us walk where we're supposed to walk in our journey. Mm. You know. Mm. So um, yeah, I'm getting a little hot in here too. <laughs> <laughs> if if, uh, if I can impose one more question on all of you, I, um, uh, and I'll start with you. Um, and it's actually part of it's actually part of um, why I initially approached you, um, Dr. Johnson Jennings, about. Yeah. Um, about poisoning, the poisoning issue, um, we have um, I, a lot of our funerals are done in the early childhood center here, and um, which is where I work. There's a big gym there, and they, mm -hmm. the funerals are done there. And there's a fire. There's some other things that are done um, in the ways, you know, traditional ways here. And there was a period of, uh, last year where it was just about every week, mm -hmm. sometimes more than one a week. Um, there were deaths of people that were far before their time, mm -hmm. and some of these were related to um, chemicals and, and drugs. Now, specifically, one of the projects that we're working on relates to the use of so-called synthetic yeah. um, drugs. But um, the more that I've been researching this, I've come across that um, addiction is a big part of it, and also um, access to... Um, as access to things like, you know, oxycodone and, uh, and other right. opiates have become more scarce, people are turning to other things, including heroin, which I'm, I'm telling you, it was a bloodbath. It was it was four or five, and it was and, and even, um, you know, being from outside the community, my connections to the community are such that, I mean, it, was, it's, it affects everyone. It's someone's nephew, someone's, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. 
So um, I know that you're doing some research on that, um, and I wonder if you could talk about that specifically as it relates to the indigenous community. But um, yeah, well, um, I'll start by saying I am a psychologist, an integrated primary care psychologist, and. Um, I had this notion that I would like to do um, testing and psychometric um, development, so creating tests that were culturally specific to Native communities so that we would know about Alzheimer's in a different route, what was culturally appropriate, what was not, um, changing um, how we perceive different, because we have a lot of labels we put on children especially, like ADHD, and maybe developing more appropriate tests that would rule out other issues that may be occurring. So that was my initial goal uh, when I was finishing up my my doctoral work. But during my rotation in the, I worked in an urban medical clinic, um, actually what started to become very pressing was actually the prescription drug misuse. And what we were finding was patients were coming in, um, getting medication, maybe giving it away to someone else or selling it. And at that time where I was working in $60 per pill, um, whereas they were also being targeted by gangs who brand heroin, where it was $20. Yeah, so you see the cost difference, and then a lot of people who are addicted to the opiates would then move on to the heroines with the different um, excess, as they couldn't get the prescription drugs, or as you know they clamped down more at the clinic. Um, so, you know, part of it was that I was told to do this work um, and start looking in that direction by a lot of the community members who were coming in, and um, I felt that was the big pull and big need. And so I started researching and doing different projects. Um, one of my first projects for my dissertation was looking at how healthcare providers perceived American Indians um, who were in chronic pain and how, they, how the decisions they would make, whether they would prescribe or not, whether they would speak with a traditional healer, um, what that would look like. because. If we look at the genetic work that's coming out in other communities, you're finding that those critical years, early childhood, of being in a loving, supportive environment, um, actually have an influence on what genes are expressed, and those genes that tend to correlate, I mean, there's no exact science, but tend to correlate with addiction. Um, are suppressed when you have all this love and support. So you look at twin studies and say, well, this twin that was raised in an environment that's very loving and supportive and caring um, ended up not becoming addicted to medications or uh, other substances, whereas the other one who had an unfortunate experience of living at a home that was not that way ended up being more susceptible to substance misuse. Um, so it, that drives some of my initial interest looking at the preventative factors. Um, I think as a whole, American Indians have some of the lowest rates of substance use, especially with alcohol we know in different studies. Um, Dr. Phil May has demonstrated that time and time again that um, there's very little um, alcohol use, but yet when they do, there is um, a high occurrence of binge and a lot of alcohol disorders that we would uh, term that anyways within psychology, so substance use disorders. Um, so I think for you know my new substance use, there's probably the same pattern occurring. And as we're gathering more data, we see a lot of people don't misuse, but those who do um, tend to do so at higher rates. And American Indian women in particular have the highest rate of mortality from overdose with prescription drugs, unintended mortality. So they're dying, um, not necessarily suicidal, but um, and and to see those figures and it, it keeps rising. Um, you know, if you look at overall, it is white Europeans who are, have a higher mortality rate from prescription drug misuse. But when you divide it by gender, it's American Indian women. So I, I think part of that is looking at our relationships with those medication. And um, as we look at prescription drugs in particular, there's this idea that they're very safe they're being prescribed by healthcare providers. Um, it's not necessarily misusing. And um, pain comes in many different forms. It's a psychological process as well as a physical process, which is also piques my interest in pain and how we deal with that culturally and how it's expressed. Because um, there is definitely legitimate pain that occurs within the clinics too. We also have the flip side so people aren't being treated. Um, but then also look at how are we going to treat them and in what setting. Uh, plays a big role in who has medications and who doesn't. And then in a cultural setting, if you have medication, and people have told me, and my brother or sister is in pain, and I was told this medication is safe and able to take it, of course I'm going to hand that off to my relative. Um, and then who's susceptible to those medications? Um, 
varies within families even, but those who are susceptible, then they're highly susceptible and they're very addictive. And so it's very easy, I think, for a lot of people to go from this opiate misuse and then on to heroin, on to looking for other drugs that may assist synthetic drug use. Um, I, I, I don't know because we haven't done the research on it, but my hunch would be that it's also seen as safe. Um, they're selling at a store. It's not really doing drugs, so I'm okay. And uh, unfortunately, it's had some horrible consequences within our community, in particular here in Duluth. Well, I know that at times synthetic mm-hmm. drugs is definitely, uh, particularly synthetic uh, cannabis, is definitely on the rise, mm-hmm. and particularly in uh, targeted high, uh, you know, low-income Maori Pacific communities. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, and it's legal over 18 still. And so, you know, I think there's a, there is, there are those issues um, globally that are building amongst Indigenous people because we're seen to be a target for that new market of drug. And so we'll have people lining up 20, 30 deep, you know, mm-hmm. waiting for the shop to open for that legal drug. And, you, you know, so it's, um, it's an ongoing issue of the way in which drugs are brought into our communities. I mean, alcohol, mm-hmm. um, cigarettes, mm-hmm. um, psychopharmaceutical, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. uh, that are uh, used to control our people. And, and very little, you know, uh, kind of investment into things like, say, historical trauma in the way in which mm. we know that historical trauma, intergenerational for our people, contributes to chronic pain. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, you know, giving a pill to that ain't going to fix it. You know, it's not going to fix it. We need to have a much broader take and view of how we're going to deal with that. So, and definitely the synthetic drugs market is... is you know, it's on the it's on the uh, increase at home, and it's legal, and mm. it has uh, much worse impact than um, you know because it's so available than many of the other drugs on the market, and so that alongside alcohol mm. is uh, really building for a whole other series of issues. Um, I think there is a place around looking at. Uh, uh, so begin a conversation, the legalisation of cannabis at home. I think that there is, uh, as a, we don't have it as a medicinal plant um, yet, uh, but I think there's a growing movement uh, around that, and we should be removing those uh, drugs and alcohol that actually, actually do damage mm-hmm. to yeah. our people. So I think you know, we've been interested in the yeah. kind of medicinal use in Seattle and the legalisation of cannabis products as healing products and... Um, I mean, clearly there is recreational use as well, but there is definitely a lot more um, view on healing plants where they come naturally from the earth. Well, I I was even here, those who suffer from chronic pain, um, some of the initial studies by Dr. Novins and Denver, they find that if someone suffers from chronic pain, it's a traditional healer, they have much better health outcomes if they're indigenous. the medications, mm-hmm. and there's a lot of data with medications, and mm-hmm. how effective they actually are. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Coffee. Yeah, we actually we should get going because. Um, I'm sorry, you all. You just were talking so great. <laughs> 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 I just want to get a couple of still shots of you all. I'm sorry that I left right when you were talking. Oh, no, that's okay. no, 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 that's this fine. actually um, is what kind of led me to all of you is this particular project. But um, we have a health show that we're working on, and so we'll use a lot of this conversation with all of you um, mm-hmm. as it will see what, what worked out for you. Oh, sure. um, and. Um, <laughs> But, um, yeah, everyone is really kind of like freaked out 
about um, these synthetic drugs and mm-hmm. we're freaked out about them. Mm-hmm. That and is so prevalent amongst our young people. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. You, you can see kids lining up in these school uniforms. Mm-hmm. And, you know, wow. in South Auckland. Mm-hmm. It's just that's very scary. Mm-hmm. That's very it's because scary. Why nail polish, use? I just heard too. Nail polish remover is one of those that they're banning. I just heard it on the Late Show last night. Oh. Um, because there, there's a way to make. I didn't hear you talk about what's happening in Hawaii with them. Have you been hearing anything about it? Oh yeah, it's 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 the same. I mean, there's there's um, you know, everybody's all freaking out over there as well. Mm. Lot they, they, they we have a lot of rape parties oh, wow. in Hawaii, a lot, yeah. a lot, and so that's why mm. you find it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. That's...